Hello there, I'm Gary. Welcome to my channel and welcome back if you've been here before. So today is combo special day on the kit of the week and this week's kit is the Aston Martin DBR9 race car in 132nd scale from FX. I'll start with having a look at the history of the Aston DBR9, particularly at Le Mans. Then I'll have a look inside the box and see what you get for your money. And of course, then show you how to build it. All of these bits come as chapters you can flick back and forth between them as your heart desires. Now, if you like this video, then please do remember to say so by clicking the like button down there. And if you haven't done so already, please do subscribe to the channel. All you have to do for that is to click the logo down there in the bottom right corner. It doesn't cost you a penny. It helps me enormously. And of course, if you want to offer slightly more concrete support for the channel, you can do that through clicking the super thanks button down there which also lets me know which videos are most popular. And you can support us more generally through Patreon and through Buy Me A Coffee. Links to both of those are in the information box below. There you'll also find the link to the FX online store if you click on that and then buy anything at all. FX at no extra cost to you will donate some money to this channel. So enough of all of that. Let's get on and start with the history of the Aston Martin DBR9. The Aston Martin DBR9 made its race debut in 2005 and cars competed around the world in the GT1 category for the next six years. The DBR9's heritage goes all the way back to 1959 with the DBR1 named after the Len owner David Brown. The DPR1 was the outright winner of the Le Mans 24 hour race that year, as well as winning the World Championship. Picking up on the company's heritage, the DBR9 was developed from the DB9 road car. The AM11 engine of the road car, a 5.9 litre V12, was lightened and modified to an eventual 6 litres, or 366 cubic inches. With race compulsory air restrictors fitted, the engine generates about 625 horsepower. Without them, it's over 750 horsepower or 559 kilowatts and torque of 650 pound-feet or 880 newton meters. With extensive use of carbon fiber and other composites, the car weighs just 1170 kilos empty. In its debut year, the DB9 won the Sebring 12-hour race in the GT1 category but finished third behind rivals Corvette Racing at the Le Mans 24 hours. Over the next two seasons, Aston Martin picked up numerous race victories, but in 2007, they were finally rewarded with a class win at Le Mans with the 009 car. In 2008, now sponsored by Golf Racing, the team won at Le Mans for a second time in the car that's modelled here. A total of 16 DBR9 chassis were built, 11 of which run races in various GT1 events around the world for the Aston Martin and ProDrive factory teams and for various customer teams. The history of the Airfix kit of the Aston Martin DBR9 is short as it comes from a single tooling of 2010. The kit was released as a standalone, then as a two-car kit with the Jaguar XKR racer before also being sold in the current hanging box with the paint, brushes and glue as a large gift set. Each time the car represented was exactly the same. There is precious little competition for this kit in the marketplace. No one else produces a DBR9 at 132nd scale. Those kits that have been produced are all in resin rather than polystyrene, such as the Renaissance kit in 143rd scale and in 124th, although the latter is a rebox of the Model Factory Hero kits, as were the releases of the 2005, 2006 and 2007 race cars. The Ultimate DBR9 currently available is probably the ABC Brianza resin kit of the 2005 car in 112th scale. The only other Aston Martin that has been offered by FX in 132nd was the DB5, the classic James Bond car. 
here seen in the 2016 hanging box. But don't be deceived by the slick box artwork. The kit comes from a tooling made in 1966. Incidentally, the same year as this overt movie tie-in release was made in 124th scale. The box is designed for retail use rather than online use, hence the back card with the hole for the hanger and all the extra parts on display. On the back of the box is the decal layout diagram. Plenty to do there. The kit comes with a token for one flying hour. You can collect these as a member of the Airfix Club towards a free kit in the future, or you can donate them to Models for Heroes. A link to this excellent charity is in the information box below. The box art is dynamic and eye-catching, showing off an Aston Martin race car at home on the track. At the back here, we have all the extras that are bundled in to make this a gift set. The paints, polystyrene, cement, and the two paint brushes, a number four and a number two. The paints are white, gloss black, blue, matte black, red, and silver. The box opens up at one end, and all the usual parts are inside. As normal, we find a decal sheet, an instruction leaflet, and two bags of parts. One large bag contains all the transparent parts, windows, lamp clusters, and so forth. Then another even larger bag with three sprues of grey plastic components and the car shell made in a single piece in white plastic. There are 52 pieces in total. The upper body shell is moulded in one piece of white plastic. And do you know, it's not too bad. It's got the classic Aston Martin front. The side grills, of course, are part of the branding. Some of the parts may be a little bit iffy. There's some flash here on this rear quarter panel joint. It will just need a bit of smoothing out. It's where the different parts of the mould meet up for this one piece moulding. One part goes here. Another goes here, then the last goes here. So there is just a little join line along here. But the rest of it is not too bad. The ejector pins are not too large and the panel lines look okay to chase in later on. The overall dimensions look in the right proportion, so this should be okay to make. Then we have sprue A. This has the interior floor the hubs for the wheels, the interior fascia, the seat. Uh, this is where the instruments would go if there were any. There are none here and none on the decal sheet, which is a little surprising. Then there's this panel here and the front air dam with the Aston Martin radiator grill here. The mouldings look okay, they're not enormously sharp, but they're okay. Sprue B has the main floor pan, as well as the four wheel arches, and a few other little bits and pieces like windscreen wiper, and so on. Sprue C has the wheels and tyres, the roll cage components, the rear spoiler, and the headlamp clusters. These would be really cool to drill out and fit with little LEDs. Now, I'm not going to do that, obviously, but I'm sure that lots of people will. And plainly, in this race, they're using slick tyres, as there's no tread pattern at all. And then the transparencies. There's the front and rear windscreen in one piece. Then the headlamp covers. The rear light clusters in one piece that fits behind the rear panel of the car and then the side windows here. The decals, they're printed by Cartograph. They're very crisp and with very good color density and registration. Airfix did a good day's work getting these guys on board. And then the instruction leaflet itself. Now there's plenty of space set aside for warnings and advice in a multitude of language. And then we have the actual build instructions. 
These are of the kind of quality you'd expect from a decade ago. These days we have lovely shaded drawings, but do you know what? They're reasonably clear. After all, there aren't that many parts. The roll cage isn't essential to get right, but otherwise it should be an easy enough kit to assemble. The first thing I'll do is prime some of the parts with grey and others with black, depending on what they will be. Here I'm starting with the wheels. The tyres need to be sanded down, but don't use too fine a sandpaper as you want them to look a little bit scuffed up. Unless of course you're fresh out the pits, in which case they'll be a little bit shiny. Now the brakes, and for the discs I'm using a burnt iron colour. Then the hubs and calipers are painted steel for contrast. While those dry, I'll assemble the tyres. There's this small ring on the inside surface of the tyre. I found the front tyres a really good fit, but the rear tyres were a little loose. If you push the face in too far, you can just raise it out with the end of a spatula or something like that until it sits against the edge correctly. Then fix it in place with a bead of ultra thin cement. When those are set, the brakes can go into each wheel. There's a square peg to help align them. Now the outside of the rim, I'm painting in steel over the black primer I used at the start. I'm just going to brush along the top surfaces here so as to get a feel of shading on the spokes. On the inside floor, there are these boxes you can pick out in aluminium if you like. On the seat, I'm painting the safety belts in red. There's a metal buckle too at the bottom, and I'm just hoping they'll actually be visible on the model. And then back to the tyres, and I'm going to paint the tread in a couple of coats of tyre black. Then the sides of the wheels get a coat of black. They're darker than the tread as they don't have any wear. Now to put the wheels on, and you need to check where the caliper is. Here it's on the right. They need to sit towards the middle of the car. So front wheel caliper pointing back and rear wheel caliper pointing forward. The square axle stub will help you get this alignment. Now while all of that's setting, I'll spray the body shell in blue. It's the paint supplied, just thinned down a little with water. I find it works okay in an airbrush. I'll also spray the front air dam. Back to the chassis now and the wheel arches can go into place. Then the floor pan goes in. Now I'll use some clamps to make all of the now I'll use some clamps to make sure all of this sits correctly because this gives rigidity to the bottom of the car and I'd like it to be straight. Now the roll cage, it goes together really well. But this last piece, the rear cross member, the instructions are a little vague as to where it actually sits. You really want them to connect to the base of the rear horizontal bar. Now the centre console, and I'll put this block of switches in first, make sure it's all painted black, and then start on the details. I just run some white over everything first, then go back with red, yellow and blue over various bits and pieces, and I'll leave some with white. I'm sure you can find references about exact colours and where they should go somewhere. I'm just after a visual effect. The steering column goes in under the fascia like this, then I can put the whole thing into the car. Of course, what I should have done is put the pedals in first, but there's plenty of space to fit them afterwards, and I don't think anyone noticed. Then the steering wheel goes on, followed by the gear lever. And when it's all set, I'll just go over with some black to get the finish level. Then the driver's seat can go into place. Make sure it sits up against the forward edge of the hole. And then this roll cage can go on. And you know what? It fits really well first time. So well done to the designers there. 
So now I'm going to paint the top of the air splitter with black as it will be visible and I'm adding a stripe of black around the bottom of the body shell. Then the front air dam goes over this splitter plate. Next up I'll put the windows into the body shell. There are tabs to get them in the right place but I found that the body shell was slightly out of alignment. So this took some gentle persuasion to get right. It might be better to use some sort of super glue spot welding instead to get it quite set, but do be careful not to craze the transparent plastic. Next I'll paint the headlamps. I wish I had the skills to put in some LEDs, maybe another day. Then the lamp housings go into the body shell. Then the rear light cluster goes in. It's in one piece, but you do need to push it in well to seat correctly. I'll also remember to paint the back of the lights in silver to give it that reflector look. And with all that done and dusted, the body shell can sit on the floor pan. Make sure all the contact points are glued and use clamps or tape to hold everything in place to set. While that's drying, I think I'll build the rear wing. There's just a couple of brackets to go in and I'll paint it all black in a moment. While I think of it, I'll paint the middle of the rear light cluster the same colour as the body. So with everything set and dry, it's decal time. The nose decal is really very fiddly. It will go on okay, but it's really difficult to set around the radiator intake on the nose and it drapes right over an air outlet. So you need to cut it to shape with a very sharp blade. I think this nose stripe should have been three or four pieces as a decal, not just two. Also where the decal sits, the nose badge is in the wrong place for the detail. Now if I build one of these kits again, I'm going to sand off the molded badge. With the decals eventually done, I'll put on the wing mirrors and then I'll fit the rear wing. The headlamp covers can go on next, fixed with a bit of white PVA as it dries nice and clear. The top of the lamp cover slips underneath the top of the bodywork. Then I'll add some transparent red onto the brake lights, some silver on the mirrors, a few last aerials, and the Aston Martin DBR9 is done. Well, let's start off with it not being a bad kit at all. It's a tricky for a starter set, but well worth the effort, I think. It would benefit from better design decals around the nose and a revised instruction leaflet in the current much clearer style. The majority of parts, however, fit very well and there are no major minefields in the build other than the shape of the body shell which seems to be a little bit pinched, making the fit of the windows a bit tricky. You can get a very reasonable DBR9 with a bit of effort. You could get a really good one with time and patience. That's it then, the Aston Martin DBR9. What a beautiful car. Now, if you've enjoyed the video, and I really hope you do, then please make sure to say so by clicking the like button down there, giving us the thumbs up. And also, if you haven't done so already, please do remember to subscribe to the channel. You do that by clicking the small logo down in the bottom right. It won't cost you anything. It helps me enormously. In any case, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time.